welcome to the September 2016 Houston Clare Coaching Meetup Group. My name is Gail Goddard. Say hi, everybody. Hi. hi. I'm a professional organizer. My business is the Clutter Fairy, so I do this all the time. Um, today, we're going to talk about, I have to read it correctly, From Heirlooms to Ikea, the role of furniture in the decluttered life. This actually came up because uh, someone requested it on our uh, our message board and they said hey we'd like to talk about furniture so thanks Barbara and simultaneously I went to do a speaking engagement last week and somebody said they raised a bunch of questions about furniture in the speaking engagement so it seemed that it was in the collective consciousness to talk about that today so that's what we're going to talk about and it's one that I think hangs people up a lot so it's a good topic so a large part of my job is to relocate your clutter to somewhere else and I go through that process by using a bunch of Ikea bags, actually, those big tarpy looking bags, and I fill those bags up with your stuff and take them off into the car and redistribute so that you don't have to do it, so that I can get it out of your house and you don't reclaim it. It's part of the redistribution process, right? And I can do almost anything except take the big piece of furniture and put it in my car. <laughs> I take the toxic chemicals to the toxic chemical place, I recycle what I can recycle, I donate whatever's donated, and then we get to the furniture. And if furniture is something that needs to go out, then I am not equipped to do that because I'm not a moving company, and because I don't have a truck and a dolly, and because, you know, if I tried to push the furniture around, I would probably hurt myself and that would be the end of that, right? So it's not usually part of my service to move it around. So I have to come up with solutions for you to figure it out. <laughs> so that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm just going to slide this over here because I'm going to keep stepping on the frame, I can tell. Pardon me. Um, let's talk about what furniture stays in a room, first of all. We're kind of wandering into interior designer territory at that point because I'm not really the expert about how a room should be laid out, but I can talk about how furniture can be placed in a room to make it easy and uh, useful for you, the movement. And the original question was, how do you decide how much furniture, what kind of placement do you do with the stuff in the room? So there's a, a collection of things to keep in mind when you're thinking about what's gonna stay in the room. And the first one is, make sure the size of the furniture fits the room. So it happens a lot that I go into people's houses and we go into the bedroom and there's this really big bed in this really little room. <laughs> and it might be up against two walls and you can't get all the way around it or there's a path that's really, really narrow or they try to put a chest of drawers in there with it. And <clears throat> the end result is you really are walking around like this in the house, in the bedroom. So. If you are trying to evaluate the furniture of the room, the first thing you want to look at is, does it, is it a size that's appropriate for the size of the room? And this will come up for you a lot if you're downsizing. Miss Ann, who's about to do this? Because you buy all the furniture for the big house that fits the rooms in the big house, and then when you downsize by 40% into something smaller, suddenly all the rooms are smaller, and the big furniture doesn't fit into the little rooms. So it's something to evaluate when you move from one place to the other. What fit in one may not fit in the next. And it's a place where jettisoning furniture out, <laughs> it's a good time to jettison furniture out. You want to think of the traffic flow and the ease of opening closet doors, uh, cabinets, drawers, and furniture. When you're standing in the room, if it's super hard to go around the edges of the furniture, if you're doing this to go down the side because the furniture is so tight, or when you go to open the closet door and it only opens halfway, or you open the closet door and it opens all the way, but there's a piece of furniture sitting right there, so you have to slide into the closet sideways to get in, you probably have too much furniture in the room. <laughs> So you want free access of here's the closet door opening, here's the cabinets are opening, and they're not bumping into it. A lot of times we put stuff in there and go, yeah, that works, it fits, and then you swing one of the doors and it hits something three quarters of the way, and then you can't get into the cabinet, right? So, or the drawers go to slide out and you can only get them halfway open because they hit something. 
if you're not able to make the furniture that's there function, then you probably got too much furniture and you probably should start subtracting. Generally, if you know, in a regular bedroom that's not the master, that's like a whole nother discussion, but a regular bedroom, a regular spare room, two or three pieces of sort of large, what I think of as large furniture is about the limit before it really starts getting crowded. You know, the bed, the chest of drawers, the desk and the big credenza, the dining table and the big buffet, right? Once you get beyond that count, you're starting to shrink, right? <clears throat> When you inherit a bunch of furniture, see, she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you inherit a bunch of furniture or you're trying to keep all of your own furniture and not let go of anything, we tend to go and start sticking it along every available wall, right? Every wall has, every room has four walls and oh, look, there's another free wall. Slap a piece of furniture in. Yeah, no. <laughs> Mostly because you're shrinking living space by you're making your square smaller by putting things along all of the walls. And so you're taking away your movement space and you're taking away some of the you know, open feel of it. And if you're looking at big pieces of furniture, like maybe it's an armoire that's really tall or a bookcase. This happens with people that love books and they have 35 bookcases in their life, right? And all the bookcases are really tall and they're like, yeah, but I can store more books. I'm like, yeah, but it looks like you're, everybody's you know, it's about to fall on everybody. There's some visual element to furniture that's over your head. When you walk into a room and you're confronted with furniture that's up here, it contributes to that sense of, ah, <laughs> you know, overwhelm a little bit, right? Furniture that hits you down here doesn't seem like it's so imposing as furniture that's taller. So you have to take the tall factor into account too. You have this really confused look on your face. <laughs> I think it makes a difference. I agree. When people get overwhelmed trying to keep all the furniture and not let any of it go, they start wedging it into all the little corners, and then you have a room that's got furniture all the way around and furniture in the middle, and then you start walking around little narrow paths. And removing a piece of furniture is a really fast way to get square footage back in a hurry, right? It makes a big dent when you take an armoire out. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly there's a wall and you can hang something on it, right? So it's a way to feel less cramped and, and feel like you have more control over your space. And if you're really visually triggered by the clutter, you know, having A, having all the walls covered is going to seem like a lot and anything that's tall is going to seem like a lot too. A lot of times I do things like when you walk into the room, people will have the bookcase along the wall that's right by the door. Because that's a skinny wall, and they think, well, this is a good place to slap a bookcase, whack. But then the bookcase is up to here, and the door is only this wide, and then the bookcase is sticking out into part of the doorway. So as soon as you walk in the door, you're sort of going by a piece of furniture, right? So all that kind of contributes to the feel of the room being too crowded. And removing one or two, sometimes taking the big tall stuff and putting it away from the door makes a big difference. Like I would take that bookcase that's sort of encroaching into the doorway and stick it on a far wall away from the door or in the far corner away from the door. So then it's in there and you still get to use the bookcase, but it's not sort of all up in your grill. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Basically when it comes to furniture, more is not better. Don't let the difficulty of the item, the difficulty of moving the item, make your decision about whether it should stay or go. Because a lot of people look at it and go, yeah, yeah, but that weighs a thousand pounds, I'll never get it out of here, so it's gotta stay. Don't let that be your deciding factor. If it's bothersome, if you don't like it, if it's a color, if it's a shape, if you think it's too big for the room, then just assume that there will be a way and make your decision about whether it should stay or not based on whether you really like it there. And we'll work out how to get rid of it later. I have two stories about that. Over the course of my speaking engagements, one lady raised her hand one time and said, some of you may have heard this story, I have this bookcase in the hallway, and every time I go by it, it makes me mad. I hate it. Why is it still there? Well, I'm saving it for my son. 
Well, how long has it been there? Ten years. <laughs> so every day, every time she walks down the hall, she's looking at this bookcase and she's angry. I'm like, so you've been angry for a decade about this bookcase? Okay, so that's problem number one. She's been angry for a decade. <laughs> problem number two, I started asking about the son. So how old is the son? Uh, 35. Where is he living? In his friend's room. Yeah, so I'm thinking that that um, path to home ownership <laughs> is not working right now. And, you know, it's not imminently going to be delivered to her son. Like, she was saving it so that he could have the bookcase in his house when he gets a house. But if he's renting a room from a friend at 35, I don't see big prospects for accomplishment there. <laughs> so, yeah, you're going to be keeping that bookcase for a while longer. So why not, instead, let the bookcase go, and if he ever accomplishes a house, you can go buy him a bookcase then. Right? You can make it happen. In the meantime, you don't have to be angry for another decade. The second one was um, a lady told me that, I can't remember why we were talking about this, but she raised her hand and said, my husband and I went shopping, and I convinced him to buy this big entertainment center, the kind that goes all across the wall and is really tall and has all the shelves and the cubby for the TV and everything, right? She, I convinced him, and it cost two grand, and now it's in my living room, and I hate it. Ooh. It's like, that's a problem. <laughs> She's like, yeah, I don't really want to be, I'm embarrassed to tell my husband that it was a buying mistake. Sorry, I made a mistake. I feel bad, and he's going to be mad. It's like, yeah, but you hate it every time you look at it, right? Yeah, so it's time to just throw in the towel and tell him the truth and make arrangements. You can try to sell it, make it disappear. Don't be living with a bunch of furniture that makes you mad. So... <laughs> A designer is always going to go out and take things out of your house because clutter makes that picture not look pretty. If you ever flip through, you know, Architectural Digest magazines, if you flip through home magazines, the picture that they take is always beautifully staged and there's nothing going on and there's a lot of space and there's one tchotchke over there and one tchotchke over there and one picture on the wall, right? So it's very um, clean. Because when you look at those pictures, you're like, oh, that's so beautiful. Well, right, and nobody's living there. <laughs> but it's, it is the, the concept of less is better, less is more peaceful, less is more comfortable is the message here. You want to aim for the least amount that supports you. And the other thing I'll say is sometimes people say to me, so I need to keep some more stuff, so should I go buy another piece of furniture <laughs> to put it in? No, that's never the answer. It seems like sometimes, and I, I guess it's a particular type of person that thinks that the storage solution of choice is to buy a piece of furniture in which to store things. And I guess it's, you know, because furniture is pretty and shopping is fun and whatever the rule is about that. but. Adding a piece of furniture so that you have more storage capacity is not really changing the square footage of your house. You're subtracting living space and putting a piece of furniture in it so you can stick stuff in it. So you're creating a pretty container, but you're still losing the, the floor space, right? You're still giving up space to stand, space to walk, space to breathe. Okay, so furniture as storage solution is not my number one choice. My number one choice is always going to be are you sure you have to have it all? <laughs> Let's talk about that. Okay. Let's assume that you've decided that some of the furniture needs to go. I'm going to do my best, if it's overcrowded, to say, do you really want all these things in here? Then let's talk about the ways to get rid of it, which is a long list, so bear with me. We're going to, this is going to be a lot of conversation. There are a whole lot of options, and a lot of them involve you spending money to make them disappear. Sorry to tell you that, but we're talking about heavy furniture. Um, you know, we don't all have Ed times three in our life, you know, to come for free because you're nice and to haul off your furniture for no cost or effort on your part, right? So we're looking at something that people get paid to do is because it's a hassle, which is why you haven't done it already yourself, right? We're going to talk about that. So let's say the very first thing you can do is move it in your own house. So this is something that I do with clients a lot. I got sliders, they stay in the car. 
I can put sliders up underneath a piece of furniture and push something around the room to reposition it or slide it down the hall. So I can move things within a house on the same floor. Um, if it's on a different floor, all bets are off. <laughs> I'm not carrying the you know old exercise machine down the stairs for you, sorry. So um, I had a client who had to move one from the third floor to the first floor and we had to hire that out because uh, no, not happening. But generally, if you think that it can work somewhere else in the house or it can be repurposed to become something else and you love it and you want to keep it, we can put some sliders under it, push it around. And I've done that with loaded bookcases, loaded buffets, I mean, things that weigh a lot of money. If the surface is over carpet, I mean, a lot of weight. I said money, right? <laughs> yeah. A lot of weight. This is a lot of weight. You can put the sliders under it, and it can weigh a gazillion pounds, and it'll still slide. I can lean into it and push something down the hall. As long as there's a path, which may be a problem, <laughs> if you're moving in something that's this wide and there's stuff in the way, but generally, you can move something along, and it's not hard. Um, if sliders aren't going to do it, or it's on a different floor, then we're moving on to the other options, okay? So let's talk about selling it. This is a long list. Get ready to take notes. <laughs> so if you're brave enough to deal with somebody that you don't know, unknown person, and in that situation I would say, if you're married and there's a husband there, if you're a mom and there's large children, you know, adult children, teenage kids there, um, then you can put it on Craigslist. Take a picture of it, put a listing, you'll end up emailing with somebody you have no clue who it is and they will have to come to your house to take it away. So, are you a single person, a single woman? I don't know that I would take that option. But if you're not the only person in the house, or if you can arrange for someone to come over and be there with you when the person comes to pick up the thing, that would be a good thing. And it's, you know, it's a way that you can put it out to a bunch of people looking for stuff and maybe they'll pay you money to have it. Now, Craigslist is a virtual garage sale. You're not making a million dollars on, you know, online used furniture, right? So this isn't how you're going to get wealthy. This is how you're going to get some money and make it go away and be someone else's problem. But it is a solution. I'm going to have to check my list a lot today because the list is long. <clears throat> anybody, and I say that to say anybody with a lot of money isn't shopping on Craigslist. They're going to buy something new, right? So the people that come on Craigslist are bargain hunters. They're young. They're, you know... They don't have a lot of resources. They're looking for a solution for them that will work that isn't a lot of money. But if you want to go there, you can use it. You can take a picture and offer it for sale on your next door neighborhood. You know what I'm talking about? Next door? Um, those great, because they're location specific, they're local to you. So, you're, and it'll be your little subdivision that you're talking to. So then it's, you can put a picture on there, you can put a price on it, you can offer it to the neighbors, and then somebody that's in your neighborhood is A, going to be more willing to come to you because it'll feel safer to them that it's in the neighborhood and they know where you live, right? And vice versa, like the person that's coming to your house is also somebody in your neighborhood and you can ask them for their address and, you know, it'll be somebody that is in your neighborhood. So it'll feel a little bit less random, <laughs> I guess. And it, having it not be, I don't have to go from Myerland to the Woodlands to pick up this piece of furniture. i got to go five blocks over to get this piece of furniture. Makes it a lot more um, palatable to the people that are looking at buying it from you. So next door neighborhood is a good solution. <clears throat> Any kind of board like that will work. Um, I do want to say if you don't have a person, if you don't want that person to come inside the house, then you have to make arrangements for somebody to take that piece of furniture like into the garage, maybe before they come, or to be there to take it out when they come. It's really your own preference about, do I want somebody that I, is a perfect stranger to walk into my house to go to the back bedroom to get that big ass armoire out of there, right? So you may have to arrange to get it into a neutral space of the garage so that you feel more comfortable for somebody to come and get it. So you may have to hire somebody to move that far. You can post a picture on Facebook. 
I laugh about that. If you put it on Facebook with a price tag, it's going to your sort of larger social network, but it's still generally people that know you and know sort of where you live. So <clears throat> you only have to have one taker, right? <laughs> you don't have to have 50 people interested. You only have to have one person interested. And so every once in a while, I'll throw something up on Facebook for a client. Sometimes they sell, sometimes they don't. Doesn't matter. Same kind of thing. If somebody needs it. The thing about your own social network is your friends may need it and you don't know that or they have a kid that needs it or they have a friend at work that needs it. And so it's sort of a way for you to contact your friends and their friends and their friends to see if somebody has a need for whatever it is that you're trying to get rid of. Okay, so let's talk about furniture resale. You can try a furniture resale shop assuming that you have a resale store in your neighborhood. Something that is, not every community has one. I'm not sure how many we have, but um, it is an option. But it is an option that requires labor and intervention. So <clears throat> the first thing is when you go to a resale store to sell furniture, you can't just drive up with the furniture in the pickup truck and expect them to take it. So you have to get approval in advance. So you're gonna have to take a picture, you're gonna have to email it to the store, they're gonna have to say, yes, we're interested in your Danish modern bed suite, bedroom suite, or no, we don't carry that kind of stuff. So once you get approval, then you have to arrange for it to be taken from your house to them because they don't pick up most of the time. And the reason I say that is they're a resale store, not a moving company. So their profit margin doesn't really allow most of the time for them to pay somebody to come move it, lift it, haul it, it changes their insurance, it, it, you know, there's like a whole nother involvement if they send a truck to you. So most of the time they're not going to do that, it's going to be your responsibility to get approval to take it and then to take it to them. It's possible, it can be done, it depends on how bad you want it in a furniture resale store. <laughs> okay. If you have a lot to sell, let's say that I'm at your house decluttering like mad, and we come up with 10 pieces of furniture that you sell, or 15 pieces of furniture that you sell. We've downsized and we're leaving 40% of the house behind, right? <coughs> you can go onto an online auction site called maxsold.com, M-A-X-S-O-L-D.com, and they do an online auction and they will come and take pictures and put it up and then run the auction and then when uh, all the things have been purchased they will be at your house to receive people and pass the things out to the people if you do that then of course it becomes somebody else's responsibility to come to you so they're the ones who have to get the sh movement happening they're the ones that have to pay the movers or have it be picked up or whatever it gets it out of the house <clears throat> not at your expense of course if somebody does all that work for you you know you're going to get they're going to get a commission you're not going to get 100 percent of the take because surprise, surprise, they want to get paid for their work. <laughs> what a shocker, right? So this is an option that allows you to move a larger collection of stuff and make it all disappear, not at your expense, but you're not going to get all the money for it. But it also makes it all happen in one fell swoop, right? So if you want, if you've got to move 10 pieces <coughs> of furniture, you can make an option run for some period of time, and then everything is going to get picked up all in one or two days, and it'll all be gone like that. So. There's some benefit to that. The bigger version of that is an estate sale, a traditional estate sale. But a traditional estate sale is going to, <clears throat> A, you have to, it typically has to take place in an, an, an unoccupied house. Because they're going to want to set up a sale and everybody that's going to come walking through assumes that everything in the walls is for sale. So you can't say, I'm selling this, I'm not selling that. That will not fly with any estate company. So usually this is what you're doing with, I'm clearing out my parents' house, we're moving to another house and we're leaving this stuff behind, that kind of stuff. So that requires, I'm getting rid of half the house instead of just 10 pieces to do a more traditional estate sale. So what about giving it away? That's some selling options. What about giving it away? So maybe you're not so worried about making a lot of money off of it or making a little bit of money off of it. That sounds like too much trouble. Let's just give it away. So what can you do? The first one is, and we talked about this earlier, take a picture and email all your friends. Because surprisingly, if you have a collection of email friends, you know all those people, 
you will let them in your house <laughs> and you can take a picture and you can throw it out there and see what happens again you're mining your network of friends and their friends and their relatives and their you know maid and their you know cousin and whatever to see if somebody has some need for this bed or this bookcase or this whatever if that doesn't work then you can move on to social media again go on Facebook and say hey I have this thing and instead of $200 it's free who wants it it's free come to my house and get it you're accessing your net your you know larger social network at that point same thing it might make it go away this also applies for um, message boards like I think of um, apartment complexes always have boards up by their uh, mailboxes and if you go to in the break room at work there's always places to tack up things it's a population of people that you generally know <laughs> like somebody from work that's gonna come to your house and take it away is gonna show up to work the next day so they better be nice while they're in your house you know what I'm saying it makes it a little bit more approachable for you and then it's depending on how big of a company you work for there may be 200 people that can look at your thing and go oh yeah yeah my daughter needs that right She's going to college, she needs that in her apartment. You can also try next door neighborhood for this. You go through your email, you go through social media, you go through your work boards. If none of that gets somewhere, go back onto next door neighborhood and you can put it up for free. Hi, this is for free. Come and get it, who wants it? Make an arrangement, that's again, talk, talk, talking to the people that are locally available to you. And I'm making those suggestions because I don't want you to have to interact with every random stranger in Houston, right? Like if you put it up on Craigslist, there's like five million people looking at that. <laughs> you don't know who that person is. So it just gives you a little bit a uh, smaller pool to swim in, I guess. So you can try to donate it to charity. This is an option that everybody loves, except that they always want the, not to have to do anything for the charity to come and pick it up. Like somehow the charity is supposed to magically know that you have the furniture and come and get it and not bother you and take it away and be happy to have it. Well, you know that's not exactly how it works, right? <laughs> so assuming Salvation Army comes, they're happy to pick up some furniture, but you have to call them and get on their schedule. And the thing about that is they have so many employees and trucks and a lot of people that need pickups. And so you may have to wait a while to get in their queue to have it come and go away, which is fine. Don't be, you know, cranky about it. <laughs> they're coming for free and they're taking it away for free and they're providing you with a mover and, you know, be good about it. We locally have a Houston Furniture Bank that will also come and take furniture away. Um, the same thing. You should call and tell them what your items are. It needs to be vetted for their purpose. So they're going to want to, they're going to want to make sure that it's clean and it's in good repair and it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they're going to ask you about it. They're not going to take <coughs> those kinds of things. They're going to be willing to take other kinds of things. So you have to call, you're always going to have to call and say, Hey, I have a blah, blah, blah. And let them ask their qualifying questions to make sure that they want what you have. And don't be offended if they say no. It just means you have to work a little harder. So Goodwill cleverly in Houston has partnered with College Hunts Hauling Junk, which is a company of hunky college guys. If you want to look at some hunky college guys, <laughs> um, they will give you a discounted fee, a discounted hauling rate to take if it's designated for Goodwill. So they'll come to your house, they'll remove it wherever it is, they'll put it on their truck, and they will drive it to Goodwill. And they will charge their regular hauling fee with a discount for Goodwill donations. So that's a way for you to get the bodies, get the people willing to come all the way into the house and take it from the second floor and haul it down the stairs and go put it on the truck. And you can stand there and fan yourself while the college guys go by. <laughs> and then it will disappear and go to Goodwill, which is a good thing. But they also don't want it to not stay, not broken, not beat up, right? It needs to be in good repair and good working order. There are online scheduling websites, which I found really interesting. I was looking to see for donation pickup, and I haven't researched them or tried to use them yet, but I did Google them to see what was out there. And one of them came up, pickupmydonation.com pick up and donationtown.org. So those are scheduling services where you go online and say, here's my name, my info, and here's my zip code, 
and they will give you some options of who will come and take your donation, which I thought was interesting. So I need to explore that, but I wanted to put them out there because if you're uh, if you like working on the internet, here's some place that you can go. I've I've looked at one of those. I don't remember which one. And when you tell it the kind of thing you're donating and um, and your zip code or whatever, then it gives you it might give you three organizations in your area that have good that do pick up. So it gives you the referral. Veterans and Goodwill and Salvation Army pick up in your area. Awesome. That kind of thing. And yeah, it narrows the. The it narrows the search for you. Yeah, that's awesome. What were the two sites? So, um, pickupmydonation.com and donationtown.org. I think that I, that I think I checked the second one. Donation Town. Okay. Well, so it's a good it's a good way to make sure that the people that you're trying to call are actually operating in your area. In Houston, we have a whole lot of options, right? So there's probably a whole bunch of choices here. But if you're in a smaller town, you want to make sure that you're dealing with somebody that is working in your area. So if you belong to or live near a large church or some other religious organization, I think you can make phone calls to those people and say, Hi, I have some furniture to donate. Do you guys have some sort of mission work, resale store, program going, collecting, whatever. I know that there are big churches that do that kind of support work for refugees and domestic violence and homeless people and whatever, and they're sort of working as a bypass. They're helping flood victims or whatever. And if you have, if there's one near you, it's a perfect place to call and say, hey, got some stuff, do you guys have a, a mechanism? Because there might, there very well might be. It is, it's clearly, you know, it's a total crapshoot whether that's going to turn up something or not. But in a city this large, you know that they're doing all kinds of work like that all over everywhere. And so it'd be a great place to try. Um, I would say make sure you're talking to the secretary or somebody on the staff who actually knows the programs instead of the person who's answering the phone who's probably a volunteer church person that doesn't know diddly squat. <laughs> get to a staff person ask the question but it might turn up some avenues for you and then they're going to have if they're having a program they have volunteers that do pickup yada 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 so it may be a way for you to get it off that way and generally if you're willing to make enough phone calls and be creative about who you call you can probably find somebody that needs it wants it will make it go away I'm saying that because if you are cash strapped and the idea of hiring somebody to move it around is not in your budget, then you're just going to have to do sweat equity instead. You're going to have to be more creative about how you find a solution. So gear up for making a bunch of phone calls. Okay, so let's assume that you're not selling it, you're not donating it, we're down to trashing it. So here's the trash it list. If you wouldn't buy it at a garage sale, probably nobody else would either. If it smells like dogs, because you know if the dogs sleep on the couch, it smells like dogs forever. Now, dog owners, cat owners, we surrender to this, and we live with the cat hair on the couch and the cat, you know, the doggy smell on the couch. But someone who is not that person is not doesn't want to smell your dogs, and so the couch is going to have to go on to someone else. If it's torn, if it's broken, if it's in, you know, bad shape, if it's stained, it's really not... It, it's not going to be claimed by anybody and it needs to be trashed in some way. So there's the trash list. Turn the page. So the first one, the obvious one that everybody does is they put it out for heavy trash. So the caveat that I'm going to put out for that is usually they let you start putting stuff out the Friday before heavy trash. So if you get it out Friday afternoon or evening, then it can be out there for three days maybe or four depending. You know, maybe you're your heavy trash pickup is Wednesday and they let you put it out the Friday before. So then it can be out there for a week, right? So the people that like to pick heavy trash will be cruising the neighborhoods when heavy trash comes up looking, right? So that gives five days for somebody to pick it. <laughs> so A, get it out there for heavy trash. If your neighborhood isn't super jumpy about it, some neighborhoods completely will not go with this and it depends on how much of a rebel you want to be, right? But you can do that on a non-heavy trash weekend, um, assuming that, okay, I've got it and I want to put it out on Friday afternoon. 
and let the Saturday traffic go by and see if somebody doesn't pick it overnight. If it's not, if it's still there after 24 or 48 hours, you know, I would say don't uh, poke the homeowners association and go put it back in your garage. <laughs> but it's a shot. You can take a shot if you think it's in good enough shape for somebody to pick it. You can go put it out in a non-heavy trash day. Don't sue me, homeowners associations. <laughs> and you know, see if it gets picked. Because surprisingly, you know, I put things at the curb for years. Whatever it is, I go in the house, 45 minutes later, it's gone. gone. Like this. <laughs> right? Only one time did I put something out that it was just like such junk. And it sat there for like 24 hours. And I was like, okay, I really have to throw it away now. It has... It has it has failed the urban picking myth, <laughs> and no one really wants it, and so I put it in the trash. But I only had to do that one time over a decade, so I think the, uh, the ratio is pretty good. Likely, if it's something big and it's usable, somebody will come and take it away. And then they're going to put it in their own truck, and then you don't, all you have to do is get it to the curb, right? Just bring it back in if it's not every trash day and it's not gone after a day or two. The other option is a waste management bagster. So have I talked to you about bagsters before? Waste management provides a tarp-like material bag that folds out on the driveway in a big square mm -hmm. and it has handles on the side of it. And you can put furniture in it. So it, it takes 3,300 pounds. So I defy you to come up with 3,300 pounds worth of furniture. <laughs> you can put it in there. It just has the, the waste management arm from the truck has to be able to go and grab the handles, right? There's handles on it, so they put the handles together. They have to easily be able to do that, so it has to close over the top of the bag. But you can lay down, stand up, line up pieces of furniture in that bag, and then you will be buying the bag for 30 bucks at Home Depot or Lowe's. You can order it online from Amazon. They'll ship one to you. And then you're gonna pay the pickup charge. So you go online with Mace Management and schedule a pickup. So if you put it in on Saturday, you can go online and pay the 129 or have, it depends on the area what the pickup fee is, but it's somewhere between 125 and you know 180 something like that. They will come a couple days later and the arm will swing down and pick up the bag and put it in the truck and drive away. So for that kind of go to the dump money, all you have to do is get it into the bag. <laughs> and then after that, a big truck and an arm takes it away and you don't have to work very hard at all. So I use that a lot to clear out garages, but that's the kind of stuff. The dead, broken furniture ends up in the garage and that's the kind of stuff we end up throwing in the bagster. So um, that is a really low cost solution. If you can come up with a couple hundred bucks, you can make something go away and that's an awesome thing. And people pick the bags, right? Because the bag's sitting there on the driveway because it has to be in a specific placement so that the truck can get to it. And it's there, and it's probably going to be there for 48 hours or three days, maybe, before the truck comes. And things disappear out of the bag. It's like, awesome. It's not going to the landfill. Somebody else takes it home, right? Away it goes. I had one of those, and they completely picked it, so I never had to have a pickup. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> but then I That's felt like I wasted the $30. Oh, my <laughs> God. You got $30 of free nothing. That's awesome. <laughs> Craigslist. That bag is good forever, right? You pay the bag, and you can use it any time. So you just fold that sucker up and put it in the garage. Did you have to pay the charge? Had you already scheduled the... No, I never scheduled it. She never scheduled it. Uh, emptied the next day. I was like, Whoa. That's so awesome. <laughs> I've never heard that story. That's awesome. I did a house where um, the woman was downsizing out of the house, and she was moving into her daughter's house. And so there was a huge garage full of stuff. She and her husband had lived there, and the kids had grown up there, and it was a massive amount of stuff. I had to do three bagsters on the driveway. I've never had to do three before. We filled up three, and about half of it got picked before the scheduling came. But they were really full. <laughs> it was jammed full. They needed to be picked so that they would be hauled off correctly. But I've never heard that it's been empty 100%. I totally love it. That's awesome. See, there could be magic in the Bagster, right? <laughs> Thebagster.com is the website for that. So you can see their uh, process and understand how to do it. So here's the uh, last part of this conversation today. Lots of people say to me, but I live alone. What am I going to do about the bodies that I need to move this stuff around, right? Like I'm, a, I'm living alone and occasionally I make Ed come to my house and do stuff like, please come move my bed, <laughs> please pick up this armoire and take it into the other room, that kind of stuff. 
So um, Ed and Jaime come as my team, but if you don't have a, a ready available, you know, heavy lifter people, <laughs> that means that you're in a position where you're going to have to hire it out, right? So let's talk about hiring it out. Check on a small local moving company. So if you call Allied Van Lines, they're going to laugh at you and hang up the phone, right? But if you call Square Cow Movers, they're going to say, what are you moving? Where's it going? Well, I need that piece of furniture to come out of my back bedroom and go into my garage because to, they're going to come and somebody's going to come and take it away. Okay. So they'll charge you a couple hundred bucks to send two guys over who can lift, carry, and place. There's a place called um, Houston Student Movers. Well, it's, it's the moving company that's like college hunks calling junk, right? It's like college people who are making extra money being movers. So they're going to do small moves, small apartment moves, and they're going to do these small jobs for you. So there's all those kind of people out there who are looking for, you know, a few hundred bucks to move a few things around or pack an apartment and move it, and you can fall on that list. So better that you have made a few decisions at once, right? And you tell them, I want these five pieces of furniture moved into the garage because I'm selling them and pay for that one trip for them to come and move it all. You what see what I'm saying? First, what was the first one? Uh, Square Cow. Square Cow. Square Cow? It's called Square Cow. What movers, M-O-O-V-E-R, -E Movers, oh, oh, right? Oh. Isn't that cute? They originated in Austin. They have several locations in Houston. They, I hired them because they're a, a regular moving company that do full-size movers, moving jobs, but they will also let you know, answer when I call and say, my client needs the exercise machine moved from the third floor to the first floor. And they send two guys in a truck, in, you know, somebody's car over to carry the thing down. And you write them a check and they go away. So, How much does something like that cost? A I mean, few hundred bucks. I mean, you know, you're going to pay by the hour for the two guys. But they're worth it because you're not lifting it, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you've got to be strong enough to do that kind of stuff and not take your wall out on the way down. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I can roll the exercise machine down the stairs, but I'm going to be doing damage all the way down the wall, right? So you want professionals to do that kind of moving. And a square cow, is, is it $100 for an hour for two guys? Yeah, something along that line. Two hour minimum. 125. So two is pretty much your minimum, I think, with them. Yeah, and it, it includes a little travel time. But, you know, if you're trying to move a few pieces of furniture, they're going to drive there for 30 minutes or 45 minutes. They're going to have it all moved in 20 because they're going to pick it up and go, yeah, sure, and sling it, and it'll be down the stairs before you even bat an eye, mm -hmm. and then you'll be writing them a check. So they can do that. The, the Houston student movers can do that kind of stuff. Or there, I found a website that's really awesome called hireahelper.com. So that is something that you can get general quotes and reviews of people who are willing to do the work in your area. Um, I went searching on that and thought, ooh, I need, to, I need to talk to these people. And generally, the pricing was, you know, looks like in Houston, you can get help between 150 and 300 bucks, depending on who it is and what, how much you're doing. What was good about HireHelper.com was that there were customer reviews on the site. So you could look and see this person is charging this rate, and everybody that he had, they had five-star reviews. So it's a way to get a helper. And, you know, if you don't, that one doesn't work, try another one. Either way, you're going to be out some money to move a piece of furniture, right? The company that sold you the furniture didn't charge you to move it, or maybe they did, and rolled it into the price, right? It, was, it took two men in a truck to get it in your house, and it's going to take two men in a truck to get it out of your house, and there's nothing I can do about that, <laughs> okay? So just keep that in mind. Um... This was another one where, you know, you can ask for help from your friends and you may have to wait a really long time for them to show up, <laughs> right? Like if you ask for help from your friends or your family, they'll be like, yeah, yeah, great idea, mom. I'll be over three months from now, <laughs> right? So it, it's hard to pressure your friends to come and do a favor for you it's going to make them hot and sweaty and miserable and they're getting nothing out of it except the, you know, glad tidings of your heart. <laughs> so, um, unless you have that kind of relationship with somebody who's willing to come and help you, one of your girlfriends is going to send her husband over to do it for you. Yeah. 
You can probably only milk that one time. You know, you gotta be nice. You can't then go, yeah, yeah, you're my go-to guy for the next 37 projects I've got. Cause he's not gonna wanna come do your chores. He's at home doing his own chores, right? So you can invite them, but the, way, the amount of times that you can make use of that is gonna be you know, once or twice, and then you're gonna have to leave those people alone, right? <laughs> you're gonna strain the friendship. You might also, again, go to your religious center and say, hi, I need help. Is there anybody that would be willing to, you know, volunteer, blah, blah, blah. If, you, um, if, if you're known there, if you have a presence there, you might be able to tap into some ch charitable help in a place where, you know, you're part of the family, basically. You can go beg help and see what happens. It would help to look pitiful while you're doing it. <laughs> Persistence wins the race here. Yes, it's going to be a hassle to find people. You're going to have to make those phone calls, but if you want to look for the least expensive option or the one with the most uh, most pickup day options or you know what's most convenient for you, you're going to have to make some phone calls. So don't be cranky if you have to do a little work to make the furniture disappear. The people that sold it to you, you know, made it super easy because they wanted you to buy. <laughs> so you're going to have to make it super easy for somebody else to make it disappear, okay? You're, it's, you know, the karma has come back around. And don't let it defeat you from getting the furniture out of the house. If the furniture is making you crazy, it's, you know, don't be angry at the bookcase for the rest of your life. Don't be mad every time you go down the hall. <laughs> make the bookcase go away. Okay, so that's my collection of things to say and who wants to ask me questions at this point yes ma'am i just have a funny story we sold we were downsizing an aquarium mm. which is not easy that big one so we went from a 55 to a 10 and we sold the aquarium on next door mm. and the problem was we had a fish who was too big for the 10 so we put the fish on next door free you know, free to a good home. And this girl came with her big net and she scooped him up and she put him in a bucket and she took him and then we sold the aquarium after we got rid of him. So, so you had to vacate. So he, he was, <laughs> yeah, he, he was, you know, we needed to rehome him. Right, the fish had but to have a new home. Was, yeah. That's so. awesome. See, and it was somebody was nearby, so it was easier for them to come over. And we didn't make a fortune, but we, we were going to just, you know, we were just What were you going to do with it, right? Put it at the yeah. curb. Somebody asked me online, I can't remember where, um, somebody asked me online um, what to do about a metal bed oh, that, they, that. that they hadn't been able to get rid of. And I wrote back and said, it's metal, you can scrap it. You can go to a scrap company and sell it to them as scrap. Or you can put it on the curb for urban picking, <laughs> which are what makes you happy. <laughs> Who else? You have questions? Oh, Auntie. Yeah, what about them? There, there seems to be no market for them. You're correct. Yeah. So uh, the thing about antiques that are um, like any other collectible, the styles and designs go in and out of favor, right? So what was cool when your parents were buying furniture is not cool now. Or the people that collect that stuff is a much shrunken population with a really big collection of furniture to choose from, right? So sorry they're not cool right now nothing you can do about it you can try to reach the people that think it's cool but it's like anything else like there's somebody out there that's wearing 1920s flapper clothes because they think it's the super cool vintage thing to wear but there's probably two of those people in the united states <laughs> instead of you know everybody right so your um, target market is much slimmer and trying to auction this stuff off you're, you may sell it, but you're not going to get top dollar. Yeah. Depending on what it is, you know, clearly I'm not the estate sale expert and, and I'm not an antique expert either, but in general, dark furniture isn't in right now. So all that really dark brown mahogany stuff, everybody's like, don't want that dark furniture in my house. And there, the pendulum will swing someday and then suddenly it'll be in, but you may be dead by then. <laughs> and you know, you probably don't want to wait around. It's a magnificent art piece, but I mean, it, I don't, it's magnificent for someone, you know, for yeah, someone, for else. someone else, right? Well, and you know, when we emptied my mother's house, she had inherited furniture from her mother who had inherited from the parent, you know, there was some furniture in there that was 
several generations old. And I have a house and Leisha has a house and we took what we could that would work for either one of us. Leisha likes those antiques and so she got some of the antiques and I got some of the more modern stuff. But then there was things like, there was a huge buffet in the dining room that was clearly my grandmother's formal dining room, big ass buffet, right? It was massive. And it wouldn't fit in Alicia's dining room. She had her own buffet. I didn't have room in my, like I would never use a piece of furniture that big. It was too big for me. So it was sad to, we sent it off to a retail place to raise money for a charity that mother liked. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh wow, I'm sorry to release this piece of furniture out of the family, but it didn't work for anybody. And so trying to jam something that's, you know, basically eight feet long into somebody's house, no, that was just too much. And as it was, I got a truck full of furniture. <laughs> the moving truck came with furniture in it. So, and you know, I have one piece that came from my grandmother's house in Chicago when she died. And it's a really tall, narrow um, break front that's for China and stuff, but it was narrow. And it's dark, and it's the only dark piece of furniture in my entire house. And I don't give it up because it's grandma, and I remember it, and it's, you know, it's a cool piece and whatever. But I'm sure a decorator would be like, get that out of here. We're painting that. And it's like, no, no, we're not painting it. <laughs> oh, Leave it alone. One more suggestion you didn't make about disposing of the stuff is find a friend who has bought a beach house or have, right? you know, the cabin on their hunting lease or whatever, and they don't have anything in it, and they don't care what you give them yeah. as long they as want they're it. getting stuff. That's exactly <laughs> right. Some of my stuff went to the beach house in question. Now that I say that, it's true. Um, lots of people have that second home, and if they're not, you know, if it didn't cost a million dollars and they're not going to furnish it for $500,000, they'll probably take your extra bed and your extra linens, and your extra towels, and your extra dishes, and your extra kitchenware, and all that stuff. Okay? Who else has a question? All right. It's 8 o'clock, so thank you very much for coming, and I will see you guys next time.